Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. In this episode, we speak with a gal from Galway. Her name is Cora. She has a great sense of humor, talks to us about the gene mutation ATM, her travels to New Zealand and Australia, her experience as someone working with patients who have lymphedema, and so much more. She's full of great resources. Knowledge is power, so the more knowledge we have, the better we are. My parents were the most wonderful parents in the world, but combined genetically, they kind of sucked. ATM. Most ATMs give cash, but no, mine gives cancer. Welcome to the conversation. Uh, my name is Cora Fahey, and uh, I'm a woman surviving breast cancer. Um, originally, I am from the west coast of Ireland, a place called Galway. So I'm a Galway girl, like Ed Sheeran sings about. <laughs> and uh, um, I left Ireland when I was about. 18 and I lived in London and Israel for a while and then I came to America it'll be actually 30 years in February coming up here in 2019 so I'm 30 years in America genetically I was predisposed to having breast cancer it is a genetic mutation I had Um, and my sister also had it I had also the dense breast she had dense breast and cystic breast so I had been followed for about 10 years So um, by a breast surgeon, I'd been going in for mammograms and MRIs and ultrasounds and had the cystic breasts and had ultra, you know, the biopsies and excisional biopsies. So I'd been going through that for 10 years. So I think that, um, so the timeline is, I think when the, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015, I actually, part of me almost knew that something like that was such a possibility with the history that I had and with my sister's history. So um, it didn't come as a huge surprise to me, but um, I did end up doing the genetic testing. Yeah, I know when I went to speak with a genetics counselor, obviously getting diagnosed with breast cancer, this was my first time speaking with a genetics counselor. And it was eye-opening because for the first time, this is a decision to get tested and find out information about not just myself, but how it impacts family. And I think you really hit the nail on the head too when you're talking just briefly about your parents and genetically what that, how it can skip generations or go into um, siblings or grandchildren, et cetera. And the choices of what to be tested for. I was tested for, I believe, a panel of seven of the, um, I don't want to call them like the more popular genes, but you can get tested for so much. And I think it comes down also to a question of insurance and finances as well and what's going to be covered. So I have, um, I spoke with other women who got tested for 14 different types of genes or 28 different types of genes. I believe mine was about 17, they said. And of the 17, this was the only one that was a changed copy. So yeah, so of the 17, this was the one. So I was, <laughs> so I told my genetic counselor, I was like, oh, ATM. Most ATMs give cash, but no, mine gives cancer. And she's laughing her arse off. She's like, but again, and that's part of what, how I've dealt with this is finding the humor in things. So I always try to put a bit of a spin on things to make it um, easier to get through. I am a physical therapist assistant with specialties in oncology rehab and certified lymphedema. And the interesting thing was I'd I'd been certified as a lymphedema therapist since 2011. So I had been working with women who have gone through breast cancer and developed lymphedema. And right before I got diagnosed in 2015, I was signed up um, to actually take my oncology uh, courses so I could work with the physical therapist in the oncology program. And then I got cancer and, and my boss actually called me up, got over and she said, um, Cora, you know, you do not have to do this. This may, may be really, really too hard for you, you know, to work with that population you have, you know, and I was like, Oh, to no, back the truck up. I am definitely doing this. This is something that, um, 
I'll be able to bring something to the table that not a lot of people can, which is the experience of going through all of what my patients go through. And I work with um, patients doing lymphedema treatment too. So it's a big part of my life, not just um, outside of work, but inside of work too. I've been diagnosed, I think, with, I don't even know if it's like staging with lymphedema, but I have like a very early onset of it. And I am, I'm not wearing my sleeve right now, but typically I wear my sleeve and everything um, every day and do different exercises. Are you doing your, your manual lymph drainage? Are you doing your massage? I knew you were going to ask that. So I need to get back to it. I don't do it every day, but I see a difference when I don't do it. Um, and I would love if you would like to share with our listeners who don't know what lymphedema is, since this is um, part of your profession and your expertise, I would love for you to explain like what lymphedema is, specifically with breast cancer patients. How does one get it, perhaps? And then, you know, if, take it from there. Well, lymphedema is, the lymph system is a, a huge part of our body. It's actually one of the most important uh, systems in our body that we don't really think about because it's our first line of defense. It lets us know if we have infection and it helps to deal with infection. Um, and in, in lymphedema um, related to breast cancer, uh, when women have lymph nodes taken out from underneath their axillary area um, or their chest wall, um, it basically impedes the flow of the normal lymph. So what can happen is the proteins and the lymph doesn't move. And so you develop swelling below where the lymph um, nodes were taken out. So that's why a lot of women have to wear the sleeves like yourself or have to do that manual lymph drainage. Um, it's not that everybody gets it. Uh, you know, it, it's, Women have gone through 20 years not getting lymphedema, and then 20 years out, they can get lymphedema. But um, it's something that is very treatable and manageable. Uh, it is something that you learn the tools from a lymphedema therapist on how to manage that, on how to do your lymph drainage, which is a, a light massage, um, on how to wear your garments as needed, and on how to exercise to help manage that also because exercise is really good for everything so um so I, I work with a lot of women who have gone through this and like i say i've been doing it since 2011 um but it's something that uh women need to be aware of that there is a potential for that so there are different ways that you can um help decrease the risk of getting it and there are lots of organizations out there that are a great resource um online and also just talking with your surgeon if you have any questions about the fact that something might be happening um, just talk with your surgeon or your doctor and get a referral to a lymph therapist so um, but it's a um, it's something I've loved doing but it's also made me very aware of what I've gone through myself and the fact that I am also at risk for having it too so that's a really good point I feel like with once you have your lymph nodes removed it's you're doing all of these exercises and routines to make sure you don't get it. So you're constantly in this preventative phase. And then once you have it, if you have it, because it's not necessary, like you, as you mentioned, you might not um, ever get it in your lifetime. But then once you do have it, then you're still managing it. So, And it is, it is once you have the diagnosis, you have it. It is it's not something that resolves. Like I say, it can be managed, but it is, um, I always used to think, um, when I started treating women and before I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I used to think, oh my God, how horrible. Somebody gets breast cancer, that's hard enough to deal with. And then I used to think it was very rude of God to give them lymphedema on top of it. I was like, that's just rude. You know, I never knew about this until I saw a lymphedema specialist. And I realized how wonderful it makes you feel just in general and all of the benefits. It's like, again, it's a huge part of our um, well-being is our lymph system. And we don't know an awful lot about it. You know, we're always encouraging our patients to drink water. The other thing I found, um, and I, I do it myself every day, is the dry brushing with the long-handled soft bristle brush, which is a very th hard thing to say fast soft 
Oh gosh. But yeah, so that's been really beneficial for me doing that. Um, and it helps to just stimulate your lymph system and get things moving. And it does feel good. It really does feel good to do that. So, um, but the other part of what I do is with oncology rehab is also exercise. And, um, when you had sent me the email about, you know, talking about different points, you said, what helped you get through your treatments and whatnot. And actually exercise was a huge part of it. I was fortunate enough to be able to work through my whole treatment apart from the times where I had to heal from my surgeries. Um, but I exercised every day and I'm not talking about running marathons or, you know, biking up Cadillac mountain, but it was just something small every day that I did. It was a walk. It was a longer walk the next day. It was, um, yoga. It was light resistance training. It was just anything to get my body moving and, um, help me fight this disease and help me fight the effects and the side effects of all the treatment for this disease. And I found it to be, so beneficial and amazing and i give presentations to doctors offices to try to get them to refer patients and my line that i say to them is um, i can read all the studies that are out there but i don't need to read the studies because i am the study i did what they say in those studies to do and i'm here today healthy well able to run 5Ks, able to bike 50 miles when I didn't mean to bike 50 miles. I meant to bike 25, but I took a wrong turn, but I ended up doing 50 miles and I actually could do it. And that to me is a testament to the fact that that exercise does have major benefit for this disease and this illness. Very well said and so important when all the studies and everything that you're reading, it always comes back to exercise, whether it's to fight fatigue, chemo, brain. Nutrition, we are what we eat. We are what we eat. So it's, it's a combination of all of those things. When I was going through chemo, you know, I was bald as a coot, as I like to say. And for a long time, I wore the um, bandanas because I didn't want to make my patients uncomfortable. And so one day it was... I don't know, it was be ball, be free day or something. Like they have donut day. They had a be ball, be free day. And I asked one of my patients, I said, would you be uncomfortable if I took the bandana off? And they said, no, you do what you need to do. And when I would work with my oncology patients, they would walk through the door and they would see me standing there, bald, just like they were. And their mouths would drop. And I'd look at them and say, yep, me too, but we can do this. We can get through this. And it made a huge difference to not just them. It made a huge difference to me. It fed my soul and it, it helped with my healing. I really think to be able to do that with them. And, um, and again, I exercise with my patients. You know, I go home at night sometimes thinking, why am I so knackered? Oh, that's right. I just did a load of exercise with like 10 patients today. So so, but, um, so that was a huge part of what got me through all of this um, shite storm, as I like to call it. And I definitely want to talk about um, your lovely sense of humor and the blogging that you've done. But before we get onto that topic, I just wanted to stress also, I loved what you said when you mentioned exercise and how you would take these walks and just to get out of the house, get the fresh air, and then the next day go a little bit longer. I think that's a really strong message where you don't have to run the marathon or sign up for a 5k you just have to move and take that first step getting out the door taking a walk and knowing and listening to your body right so there are definitely going to be some days where you know you may not be able to walk as far that first day or second day but kind of setting these benchmarks to kind of get your body moving it's just it was was moving my body that made me feel so much better and like you said it does not have to be the half marathon or the 50 miles as I did on the bike it just has to be the moving and um and again like we talked uh being in Maine and Acadia National Park I being out in nature is just so healing in itself um you know so 
I don't know if this came up in any of your emails or anything with him. When we first started dating, he actually, when we went up to Arcadia, we were biking and I didn't realize how hilly that region is. And then, I kid you not, he took me on the bicycle up Cadillac Mountain. You actually went up Cadillac? My God, very impressed. It's one, my goal next year is um, I'm going to train for the Dempsey Challenge. So that's where I ended up. I don't know if you know about the Dempsey Center in Maine. Patrick Dempsey, McDreamy, Dr. Dreamy. Mm -hmm. Well, who I got to meet, by the way. Um, but he, um, his family have this center in Lewiston, Maine, where they provide services to uh, people in the, in actually in the whole state of Maine can come and use their services. So it's massages, nutrition, it's um, help with financial issues. And so anyway, I, I do the challenge every year and that's where I ended up um, taking a right when I should have gone left and I did 50 instead of 25. So, because again, the thing um, that I've also learned through this whole process um, is that it's, uh, the, the term I use more is survivorship. It's not just surviving the initial diagnose, diagnosis, it's living with that diagnosis. And the National Coalition for um, Cancer Survivorship, they say that survivorship is from the um, date of diagnosis through the balance of life. And that's, I think, what we need to be teaching people. And what I like to teach my patients is that uh, you need to manage this through the rest of your life. You need to exercise. You need to eat right. You need to... Um, take your medication, you need to go for your checkups. It's something that is, is something you need to do for the rest of your life. Um, because as, as we know with breast cancer, it has a high recurrence rate and it has a high metastasis rate. So you need to be aware of it and on top of it. Um, but I like to say survivorship. I'm, I'm really into that. That word is a good word for me. So when we came up with survivingbreastcancer.org, the idea of surviving, it's this continual action that goes on. I never introduce myself as a survivor. I always say I'm a woman surviving breast cancer because I think the same thing. I think this is, you know, I have to live with this diagnosis and I have to uh, manage my body to help hopefully fight against anything else coming back. But it's here. It's in me. It's my cancer. It's, it's, you know, it's something I was born with. It was mine. So I need to, to work on managing it. And I know you also have um, a great passion for writing. And we came across your blogs, which were just hilarious. Your energy, I think, jumps through the screen. I'll backtrack by saying uh, I went to the Sisters of No Mercy for 12 years in Ireland. They're actually supposed to be the Sisters of Mercy. But, you know, they used to beat the crap out of me. So I called them the Sisters of No Mercy. But they always used to say I was totally shite at writing. So I never thought I could write. Um, and it's only from when I started posting on Facebook. And, and I kind of came out about my diagnoses on Facebook after I had told my family, my immediate family. Um, I came out on Facebook and I basically let my friends or my tribe, as I call them, know that um, I, whereas I am the strongest woman that I know, I still needed support, that I couldn't go through this alone. So I just started sharing my experience on Facebook and I would have people say to me, oh my God, you need to write a blog. And I'm like, what the hell is a blog? Is this a blog? And I write it, isn't this the same? And they're like, no, 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 you need to get it out to other people. Um, and one woman in particular, it, it hit home with me when she said this. She said that when she was reading one of my posts that she started to cry and then she was reading further down and she started to laugh. And she said, she said I then knew that I didn't have to worry about you, that you were going to be just fine. Last year, Actually, no, it was this year, the beginning of this year in uh, January, I was going on a trip to Australia and New Zealand um, to celebrate my 50th birthday. Um, and I thought, why not start a blog now? Because then I can document my trip and keep everybody up to page or on the same page 
um, of my travels. And so I started this blog called irishcora.wordpress.com, I think it's called. Um, and it, I, I called it, um, I said it's a Galway girl's guide to navigating breast cancer and life in general. Um, so it's just my take on what stuff comes at me in life and how I deal with it. Um, it's not very organized and it's not like some of the blogs I see out there, which are absolutely amazing and, and um, way more organized and maybe have uh, more things on like uh, makeup and clothing for us going through this. Mine is just bleh, kind of like throw it up there what shite is happening or shenanigans as i say i kind of just write about it well it's very so real it's, it's very transparent it's very real and that's why i think it's so unique because you can i mean i didn't we've never had these conversations before but now i can like i totally hear your voice coming through in your writing and people say they're like i can totally hear you when yes. you're when i read and i'm like i read i write exactly how i speak and exactly how i think Right. It's not ethically correct, probably. There's a lot more swearing in there than most blogs would have. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it is something that, um, again, it's been so therapeutic for me. And I figured, you know, I'm going to just, like, put it out there. And if anybody reads it and they get something from it, great. If not, I'm getting something from it by kind of putting it down on paper. And before I forget, because I will waffle on about stuff, um, one of another big reason I kind of started doing this was um, like you've seen on social media, the breast cancer community is huge. It is such an amazing community. And there are so many amazing women out there that have done so many things um, for the community. And one of them was uh, the dear boobs project. And I found this on Facebook and I started reading it I was like oh dear boobs project that kind of sounds cool so what is it and it turns out it's a young woman over in New Zealand who um, used to journal a lot as a kid and when she was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, she wrote a letter to her boobs before she went in for her mastectomy to say goodbye and as a way of healing through the process and then she came out of that and her friend said to her, oh my God, you should let other women know this. This could be really therapeutic. So she started the Dear Boobs Project. She asked for women all over the world to send her a hundred letters. So she got a hundred letters from all over the world, mine included. And she, she just put out a book in October called the Dear Boobs Project. I have a copy myself and I gave a copy to my breast surgeon and I gave a copy to my plastic surgeon. They've put them in their waiting rooms and it's a hundred letters from women all over the world, Laura, who have gone through what we've gone through and it was their way of healing. And I just thought it was amazing. She's an amazing woman. Her, she's Emily Searle. And I actually got to meet her when I was in New Zealand. So when I went over to Australia, I also met a, a woman um, named Tina, and I'll butcher her last name because it's, it's, it's Deluhi. She'll kill me if she hears this. Tina, anyway, I met Tina. So Tina started a company called the Red, Red Fern Laundry. So she went through um, breast cancer. Yeah, Red Fern Laundry, she's excellent. You have to look her up as well. Um, she couldn't find pretty underwear. She loved, you know, sexy, pretty underwear, and she couldn't find any. So she decided to start her own company. And I got to meet her when I went over there in, in Australia. And then when I went to New Zealand, I got to meet um, Emily. And that's kind of where Emily helped me come up with the hashtag boob ambassador, which is my, my uh, handle on Twitter and Instagram. Because I, I told her, I said, yeah, I'd really love to be able to go to all these different countries and different parts of America and like meet these women who are doing phenomenal things and then write it in a blog and just like be able to just share my experience and share what they're doing because it's so freaking amazing. 
I forget who I was talking to, but your Instagram came up in our conversation. Um, oh, really? And because I think we were just talking about like humor and, you know, I mentioned like, oh, there's this wonderful woman up in like northern Maine and she's got diagnosed with breast cancer and she's hilarious and like just going on and on, not referring to you by name or anything. And this woman was like, oh, the boob ambassador. And so oh. it was like, <laughs> out, like you're famous. So that's hilarious. Oh, that's so cool. Thank yes. you for sharing that. That's brilliant. So is there a story from any of your blog postings that um, you would like to regale us with? Any like ones that jump out of you or your favorite moments? I well, I, I didn't know if you wanted the, um, the one I did where it was dating when you're 50 with, um, with no nipples. <laughs> yes. You know, I think that's kind of the that elephant in the room. We don't always talk about um, kind of dating and life after cancer. I think everyone, it's easy to assume, oh, your hair is back. You're back to work full time. Life right. just continues to go on. You wrap it up in a pretty bow, put it on the shelf. Cancer is done. My ex I've been single for five years. Um, my ex-husband had divorced me prior to me being diagnosed. So he divorced me in 2013. So I had actually gone on, you know, match.com because you know where I live. It's a pretty rural area. It's up there, mm -hmm. um, very seasonal. So it's full of people in the summer and completely a ghost town in the winter. So it's, you know, hit or miss as to when you can meet people. Um, so I did go on line for a year or so. And then of course I got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So one story actually that I think I might want to just let you know about with the dating thing was the, the weekend I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I actually had set up um, four dates in Southern Maine. Cause you know, I, I live up in, you know where Acadia is, it's up there. Yes. So I broadened my search criteria and I said, you know what, I'll just, I'll, I'll put it out down to Portland. Cause you know, it's more fish in the sea down there. And I'll arrange it so that if I do dates, I can do like two or three at the time. So I'd stay with a friend in um, Freeport and then I would go, you know, for a coffee or lunch or dinner or something with all these dates. Very strategic. I like it. I was, yeah, I was like, you know, it's efficient. You know, it's mm -hmm. not overdoing with the back and forth, back and forth. So the weekend I got diagnosed, I had four dates set up and then I got cancer. So I thought, okay, well, that has to go on the shelf because I'm going to be fighting cancer and that takes a lot of energy. So I'm not going to be dating. Mm -hmm. So I sent each one of those men an email. And to this day, I'm still friends with two of them. Wow. Really? Because what was amazing, the response I got from all of them was, Oh my God, is there anything I can do for you? Two of them gave me their home numbers and said, if you ever need to talk, please call. Um, and like I say, and then the others gave me their email addresses off of match.com and said, you know, please just contact me if you need to, if you need to chat about anything, which I was so happy to have that happen because it gave me hope that there are some really nice guys out there. I mean, everybody's journey through this is very individual and it's very personal and it's very different. Um, what's, what's good for one is not good for the other. And, um, I think, again, we all make those choices, but I've found some women in my life, too, that I know um, they don't really want to be involved, and that's their right, and I, I would you know, never force it on them, but I find for me, and I think you probably do, too, that right now in our lives, this is what we need to be doing. Cora, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on today's podcast. Your stories, your sense of humor, your expertise. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you everyone for listening to our show. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast are from personal experiences and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always contact your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. Until next time, keep on thriving.